password. Yes. But now we know your password. Where's he gone? Thank you. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the three main bacterial STIs, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia. Um, and I'm going, because I only have 15 minutes, I'm going to re restrict the epidemiology to recent trends. Um, I put uh, the HIV trend line here. This is the EU data. Um, just for completeness and because it's endemics, of course, and in the EU, there are clear syndemics between HIV, syphilis, and gonorrhea, not so much clear with uh, chlamydia. And also, I don't know if you noticed, but for the first time ever, actually, since we've had the data, we're actually seeing more syphilis than HIV in the EU. Um, one thing to notice, the chlamydia trend line there has its own scale. If you put them on the same scale, this is what you see, chlamydia dwarfs all others. And this is not just in the EU, of course. This is the same in the US, uh, where chlamydia cases are, are obviously more easily diagnosed, perhaps more easily reported, but there are clearly more infections as well. I'm going to be comparing quite a bit the data between the US and the EU. Um, one thing to remember when you see these numbers is that there's almost two, twice as many people in the denominator and the population of the EU than in the US. It's actually three to five. So theoretically, if we had the same type of epidemics, same rates, we should be seeing similar figures. And I'll come back to that, even though it sounds a bit strange at this stage. So let's start with chlamydia. This is the long-term trend line that we have on chlamydia. We very rarely show this, and we never publish it, because there are so many factors influencing this line. Better testing programs as, that have developed more extensive testing of certain groups, more sensitive tests, as you know, the use of nuts became more popular, even more countries reporting. So it doesn't really make sense to show this. What I, what I will show is that the last uh, data we have, 2016, we had almost, well, just under half a million cases, whereas in the US, with a smaller population, had about five times as much. Um, so let's focus on the more recent trend. This is, again, EU data. Uh, this is more stable now. And the upper line is women who are diagnosed more frequently. And the middle line is the overall trend. You can see a slightly increasing trend. To me, it seems a bit strange that these are het mostly heterosexuals, theoretically, in here. So they should be a bit closer. But my, my impression is that probably men are not getting reported, not getting diagnosed as much. The trend is very similar to that in the US. In fact, if you put the same years together, you almost see the same thing. The only thing that's different is that in the US, they have much higher rates, as you can see here, to almost twice as much. Um, and I fear that a lot of that is because their surveillance system is more mature than the EU surveillance system. Why do I say that? In this data here, many countries do not take chlamydia seriously, and they don't really report it as well. For example, in the most recent data, the country that reports most cases reported, wait for it, 5,000 times the country that reported the least data. So obviously, some countries are taking it seriously and some are not. From a male to female ratio, again, it very much follows the focus of testing of the countries. In most countries, the focus of testing is on women, young women especially, but in some countries, they focus more on men, and it's an interesting situation here. Quite similar to that in the US. Um, risk group, well, this looks a bit better now. I, of course, it's a log graph. To me, it looks a bit better. The heterosexuals are more or less following the same trend. They're giving it to each other. But we have this rising, and it's a log graph, so this is quite rapid rising, MSM epidemic. The more important chlamydia, a more serious chlamydia, is the LGV, of course, lymphogranuloma. And this is taken even less seriously by countries to date. We're working quite hard to change that. Um, only two-thirds of countries even have a surveillance systems for this. 
and many of them don't do it properly, and they recognize this, and they're working on in investing in this. Um, the countries, sort of three countries, for example, have a serious system, and they account for 86% of all the cases reported. And all the cases are in MSM. So talk about syndemics. Many of them are HIV positive. This is the trend line from those countries that have quite decent LGB surveillance. You can see it's interesting, the younger MSM, remember most of these are MSM, the younger MSM are not getting infected, perhaps there's a bit of a change, it's the over 25s, there's an epidemic. And uh, in the countries again that have serious uh, surveillance systems for LGV, this is the picture. Now, when I was finishing this, a friend of mine was passing by and he, he commented, you know, for many of the pathogens our agency follows, this picture would be called a pandemic. Multiple increase in many countries, same pathogen. Moving on to gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a more mature surveillance system, but it's again very patchy in the amount of investment there is into getting the diagnosis and reporting. We had uh, 75,000 cases reported in the last year uh, of data that we validated, 2016. That is about three times as many uh, as HIV. And some countries do it better than others. I don't think this truly reflects the balance of infection. And some countries have sentinel systems which we can't compare because we don't have the coverage very well. Remember, in the US, they see half a million cases. That's many times more than we are seeing with a smaller population. Uh, gonorrhea is more clearly focused on men, probably because of the symptoms. I don't know what's happening with Estonia there. I won't comment. Um, but the rates, again, relatively similar. More females are being diagnosed with gonorrhea in the US. If you look at the trends, male and female, Gonorrhea is much more of a male epidemic. This dip is an encouraging uh, outcome of the UK data dip that we're seeing, but most of the other countries are not seeing it, they're seeing an increase. You look at the US, this is a different scale, so we have to look at it from here. Let's see again a very similar picture. I'll go back to the EU and the US. See, in recent years, very similar men more than women, and rising at a more or less the same gradient, same slope. This is uh, Australia. Sorry, the uh, legend seems to have dropped off. Top line is men. This is the overall, and this is women. Again, very similar picture. Canada, very similar picture. They could almost be from the same, uh, except for the rates, of course, which are a bit different. In the EU, which are the risk groups, well, it's an MSM epidemic. This makes more sense to me. It's the heterosexuals are giving it to each other. This is probably getting better. Um, I, I have doubts about how many heterosexuals were here. We've heard about how many people do not self-identify with the doctor. But this makes more sense. But here there's an epidemic, clearly. This is Im impacted by the UK data, which so somebody commented, we might lose that dip, might lose the encouragement in March, I hope not, but, uh, and we might not see that dip. Hmm. This is the US, again, very similar. The heterosexuals giving it to each other at a low level, more or less stable, an endemic, if you like, epidemic, an em endemic disease, but an epidemic in men who have sex with men, same gradient. And talk about syndemics, I'll always uh, bring this up with uh, gonorrhea, quite a lot of the MSM who are being reported have co-infection, one-fourth. We never really took gonorrhea seriously, as Henry was saying. In, in public health, it was sort of a, a minor thing, um, especially since it was treated so easily. But of course, that has changed. As Francis was saying, they're, they're seeing resistance. We are seeing resistance in the, in the EU. We have our own Eurogasp uh, monitoring systems, the Sentinel surveillance system. We're especially worried about azithromycin. You know, that's a first-line drug. Some countries are seeing more than others, of course. Portugal saw one-third of their isolates being resistant to azithromycin. 
and uh, we monitor trends and resistance. Cipro is no longer used because of this. We keep an eye on this. We're quite, quite happy with Cefexime and, and uh, Ceftriaxone so far, but this might change. And if you look at the mix, what's worrying, if you go over 0.5, then it's resistant. And these are degrees of resistance. This is very high level resistance. If you look at, there isn't so much high level resistance, but if you look at the last six years here, the orange is 2016, the most recent year. You see it blip as being more or less, in, in most of the years, the highest. So we are seeing in all levels of high resistance becoming more common. The US is seeing the same thing. So here, 2016 data is the, let's call it the white bar. You see, it's quite prominent in the high levels of resistance. And of course, we had the, those cases that everyone knows about, uh, UK and Australia. Uh, what worried us was they happened just a month apart, and there were high, high levels of resistance and had to be treated uh, on empirical antibiotics. Moving to syphilis, again, very similar picture. It very much depends on the services. I don't think we, we can really say much about where the epidemic is. What I can tell you is that we had 29,000 cases, more cases than HIV reported in 2016. And here's the interesting thing. In the US, they had less. Why is that? The risk groups are more or less the same. We saw that there are epidemics happening in MSM for most of the other diseases, HIV certainly, gonorrhea certainly. The risk factors are the same, more or less, and yet they're seeing less cases than us. And I fear it's that we are missing cases of, the, of gonorrhea. That's, that's probably the reason why we're seeing so much less cases. Um, syphilis is even more of a male uh, epidemic. And if you compare the risk groups between the US and the EU, you see quite a similar picture. So we have one category, MSM, 66% syphilis. US have two categories, more or less. These are the MSMs we would consider in the EU. So that's about 58% versus 66%. Heterosexual males, very similar, 13 in the EU, 14% in the US. And then heterosexual females, in the EU we're seeing a little less than they are seeing in the US. At what stage are we catching them in the EU? Well, within a year. I'm sure we can do better. We can shift this a little bit to the left with a bit of effort. As I said, it's a male epidemic. The influence of the UK data here is not so prominent. What you need to look at is this, of course. The, in 2016, we saw a very slight increase. It doesn't even show here, but we're very worried about that. Why? Because if you look at the US, they've been seeing that increase over the last few years, and that's a bad sign. This is, of course, bad. This is an epidemic amongst men. But this is even, that's even more worrying in a, in a sense. It's also been seen in Australia, epidemic amongst men, slow rising amongst women in recent years. Same in Canada, epidemic amongst men, slow rising amongst women, just a little bit. But that's going in the wrong direction. The risk groups in the EU, again, it's MSM epidemic, Heterosexuals more or less giving it to each other. Same in the US, hetero MSM epidemic, heterosexual at the same levels. And why was I worried about that little blip we, we saw recently? Because in the EU we were quite proud about our elimination of congenital syphilis plans. In fact, we were all crowing about how it's gonna happen very soon because the trend line is very straight. But that tiny blip that we saw in the last year, that's making us have, diff have different thoughts. And of course, would that it would be so simple? Because this is the trend in the US, and that's congenital syphilis. So I fear we're about two or three years behind, and this is what our future will bring. 
against endemics, in syphilis is even more uh, pronounced, almost half the cases have HIV. Another reason why we're worried about increasing syphilis is the warning we, we heard recently from WHO that uh, production of antibiotics is, as you know, not very popular amongst pharma and production of penicillin is actually shutting down in many places. So there may be, in the short term, uh, shortages. Of course, we have alternatives, but it's not a good, good sign. I'll come to some conclusions now. So we're seeing these consistent increasing trends in the, in the big uh, STIs. And uh, I don't know why we, we don't call it an epidemic. <coughs> MSM, it's an epi in, in the high-income high countries, it's, a, it's an MSM epidemic. We need to focus more on MSM. We're failing. The epidemic is winning. We need more appropriate prevention and more holistic care. Just to remind you, and this is, if you like, an overview of the main STIs that I look at, if you consider that there are maybe 4 to 5 percent of the population that are active MSM, I'm being generous probably, almost all the LGV are MSM, most of the syphilis, and most, a lot of the gonorrhea and HIV. And I haven't mentioned hepatitis B and C, they are the, the, the second highest risk group for hepatitis B and C as well in the EU. Condoms, I mean condoms, uh, what, the side effect of the initial HIV years, condom use soared, and of course we saw that impact on STIs, but they're no longer cool anymore. Condomless sex is on its, on its way up again. And uh, just a quote from one of the many, many behavioral surveillance studies. This one comes from Australia. Um, the trend is, is quite, quite strong over the last few years. A, a condomless anal sex is, is more, is coming in much more. The prevention programs that were mentioned previously, we're not doing a very good job. They're not very visible, let's face it. I mean, we might see them in our small neck of the woods, but in the broader society, we're not seeing much. And they're a bit, let's say, passé. We have statements from all the big app owners. They're very willing to help us. This is the scene where we would target MSM, for example, if we wanted to target them. We need to do more. And I also put a finger of blame a little bit at the clinic services. They need to step up. Business as usual isn't, isn't going to work. Um, as we heard before, there is a still stigma. There is this uh, don't be seen under the clock attitude is still present. And uh, we need to make them a bit more, make, make people more comfortable coming to our clinics for testing and treatment. And we've seen examples of this in London, Dean Street and others. Um, and we need to prepare for the gonorrhea resistance. Um, I know WHO is taking this seriously. More time with the patients, especially more time for test of cure. That's how we found out about the XDR uh, gonorrhea in UK, for example, because they have very good, rigorous follow-up with patients. How many of us are doing that in the rest of Europe and in the, in the high-income countries? So I'll close with this. It's a bit like uh, under the clock. We need to eliminate this. There shouldn't be even a sign. And I want to thank... Uh, all the collaborators we have, we have a, a, quite a strong network of collaborators that provide data for our EU data that you've seen. A special thank you to my colleague, Fran uh, Gianfranco. Thank you.